Hello, in this video, I'm going to discuss muscle relationships. Okay, so uh, traditional muscle roles. We have the agonist, that's the prime mover. Uh, that's the move muscle that's contracting concentrically to produce the greatest amount of force to cause the action. Um, so as we've discussed, a concentric contraction is when the muscle is contracting and producing force while shortening. Um, so the agonist in, a, in an action would be the biggest, strongest muscle that's producing the greatest amount of force um, that is acting concentrically. So it's shortening as it's contracting. Okay, the other roles that we're going to define here, so like antagonist, synergist, et cetera, those are all in relationship to whatever we've defined as the agonist. The antagonist opposes the concentric action of the agonist by relaxing or contracting eccentrically. Okay, so it could be either, um, so it's just the muscle that is opposite of the agonist. So it would be the biggest, strongest muscle that has the opposite um, actions when it acts concentrically. So like in um, elbow flexion with the forearm supinated, the agonist would be biceps brachii. Um, because it's the biggest, strongest muscle, it has the most direct line of action when we're in supination. So it is the agonist. The antagonist would be triceps brachii because it does exactly the opposite when it acts concentrically. Um, so it has exactly the opposite action of uh, extension of the elbow um, if the triceps brachii were to contract concentrically. Um, so during elbow flexion, with the hand supinated, of course. Uh, the agonist would be biceps brachii, and the antagonist would be triceps brachii. The synergist is any muscle that contributes concentrically to the action of the agonist muscle, uh, but it's to a lesser extent than the actual agonist. Okay, so any muscle that is also contracting concentrically to produce the movement would be considered a synergist. Okay, so uh, if we're back to our example of elbow flexion with the forearm supinated, uh, then the synergists would be brachialis and brachioradialis. They're smaller, they have a less direct line of action when we're supinated, uh, so they're contributing less force to the action, um, but they are both still contributing force concentrically uh, to that elbow flexion. Now, if I changed the position of my form, if I went into a neutral position or pronation, then I would be changing the relationship between those three, uh, where if I'm in neutral, brachioradialis would be the agonist and the other two would be the synergists. And if I went into full pronation, brachialis would be the agonist and the other two would be the synergists. Okay, so these muscle roles change depending on what the action is, depending on what the position is, like just changing the position of my forearm changed these muscle roles um, in the same action of elbow flexion. Okay, then we have a neutralizer, which is also referred to as a fixator, it means exactly the same thing. Uh, that's a muscle that provides a stabilizing force to determine which of the agonist's attachments will move as a result of the contraction of the agonist. Okay, so as we've talked about before, when a muscle contracts and it shortens, it can pull this attachment closer to the other, or it can pull this attachment closer to the other. So when the muscle shortens, it could pull on either bone and cause movement. Now, generally speaking, it's whichever bone or whichever limb or, or segment that has the least amount of mass is the one that's going to move because it has less inertia than the other one. Um, so as a general rule, that's true. Uh, but we have neutralizer or fixator muscles that produce force to act on the bones that that muscle, the agonist muscle is attached to, uh, which helps control which bone is moving and in what direction it's moving. Okay, so it can provide direction for the action, especially when an agonist muscle is capable of producing several different actions at the same time. Okay, so it could be a matter of which bone is moving or it could be a matter of in which direction the bone is moving. So like, for example, latissimus dorsi comes under the arm and inserts into the front of the humerus and its concentric actions are adduction, extension, and medial rotation. 
So when it contracts, which of those three actions or combination of those actions it produces depends partly on what position the humerus was in to begin with, uh, but it also depends on the contraction uh, and the force production of all of the neutralizer muscles of the shoulder. Um, because it's possible that we're in abduction and latissimus contracts and pulls us down, that would be adduction. But it would be the action of the lateral rotators or the external rotator muscles that would prevent latissimus from also medially rotating the humerus at the same time as it adducts. Okay, so a neutralizer muscle would be one that is in that region that is helping to control or stabilize uh, what bones are moving and in what way as the agonists and synergists are moving the joints. Okay, a supporter muscle is one that's usually located in some other place, you know, somewhere else from where the action is actually taking place. Um, this is a muscle that supports the position of other areas of the body while the main action is executed. Okay, so like in this picture, she's doing a bicep curl. And so like we've already discussed, we talked about, you know, the agonists and synergists and the antagonists of a bicep curl. Um, but we didn't talk about all the muscles throughout the body that are stabilizing to support this posture as she does this bicep curl. Um, so she's standing and all of the muscles on the posterior side of her body have to activate to maintain this posture. Otherwise, the weights that she's holding in front of her would pull her center of mass too far forward and she would tip forward. But that's not happening because the muscles on the posterior side of the body are contracting to pull back and stabilize her position. So all of those muscles would be supporter muscles. All of those that are acting in other parts of the body to support the position that's required to be able to do the action that we're analyzing. Okay, so I think this is just kind of running through uh, the example I really just gave. If we're doing a standing bicep curl or dumbbell curl, uh, biceps brachii is the agonist. And again, that's because we're in a supinated position. If we were neutral or pronated, the agonist would change. Um, and so it's agonist because it's producing the greatest amount of force during elbow flexion. Um, and then brachialis and brachioradialis are the synergists. They're contributing to the action, but with less force than biceps brachii because of the position of the forearm. Uh, then triceps brachii is the antagonist because it's contracting eccentrically uh, during elbow flexion, and so it's controlling the action. Um, and then we have lots of fixator muscles that would be like deltoid, coracobrachialis, rhomboids, pec minor, just for a few examples, but we could probably list more. Um, so they're acting to maintain the position of the scapula and the glenohumeral joint to maintain the position of the scapula and the glenohumeral joint. Um, that's strange. <laughs> I wrote it twice there. Okay, so the point is that if biceps brachii shortens, it would cause flexion at both the glenohumeral and the elbow. But if we only want flexion at the elbow and to maintain a steady position in the shoulder, then we need to activate our fixator muscles that are gonna help hold the glenohumeral joint in extension and prevent it from flexing as the, or as the biceps brachii contracts and shortens. Okay, then we also have supporter muscles throughout the body. So like erector spinae, quadriceps, hamstrings, soleus, um, muscles throughout the whole body that are maintaining our postural support so that we can accurately complete the movement that we are trying to do with our upper extremities. Uh, so without the increased activation of these muscles, the person would be pulled forward by the weight of the dumbbell and would not be able to execute the action. Okay, an anatomical force couple is when two muscles contract simultaneously in opposite non-collinear directions to prevent unwanted motion or achieve an action. Okay, so we have two forces going in opposite directions and they're not collinear, meaning like they're not in the exact same line of action. Okay, they're not collinear and they're going in opposite directions. Okay, so you can imagine like holding two hands on the steering wheel and turning the steering wheel. 
in that case, we're applying two forces in opposite directions. We're going like this to turn the steering wheel. Okay, so those, that's an example of a force couple, it would be two hands turning the steering wheel. Okay, so an example in the body would be like upper and lower trapezius working together to cause upward rotation of the scapula. Okay, so if you recall, both upper trapezius and lower trapezius, like we see in this picture here, that's the UT and the LT, um, both are contributing to upward rotation of the scapula. And so that's when the scapula turns so that the glenohumeral joint goes in the upward direction. Um, so they work together to cause that action because they help to make pure upward rotation without having elevation or depression as part of the movement. So if only upper trapezius contracted, we would get upward rotation, but we'd also get elevation because it would also pull up on the scapulas. And then the opposite is true of lower trap. We would get upward rotation, but we would also get some amount of depression because it's pulling down, um, it's pulling downward as it's shortening. So when we contract both together, um, upward rotation happens, but the two balance each other out with their elevation and depression. And so it allows the scapulas to main, maintain their um, steady position on the thorax. So the muscles in an anatomical force couple are synergists that work together to accomplish a movement. So in that case, we wouldn't really say one or the other was the agonist. We would say that rather they're synergists forming a force couple. Okay, that is all I have for you in this video. Thank you for watching.